All right, for our message today, we have a sermon from Matthew Steele returning um, called Hubris and Hope. Mr. Steele. Am I on? I'm on now. My ears still don't work. Uh, Before I begin, I just apologize ahead of time. I'm still having some drainage and some allergies today, so I'm really not spewing this evil condition all over everybody, Um, but I do uh, beg your indulgence for the occasional uh, cough that, that may be going on here. And then also, I'd just like to um, publicly thank everybody for your prayers and uh, your interventions for us um, as a family, and, and many of our different church families uh, have been impacted by this at different times. And I'm uh, very grateful for being carried in prayer and getting text messages and getting magical uh, food showing up at our door and. Um, being taken to doctor's appointments and, and, and so on, um, such a huge uh, blessing. Still have some tiredness, still have, um, I could really do with a nap right now. <laughs> Maybe it was a little too early to come back uh, speaking, but uh, I'm hoping that um, some of this makes sense because it was actually born out of uh, my experience and some thoughts that have come to mind from that experience. And I don't want to bore you with all the juicy details. There's plenty of uh, images you just don't need to see in your mind's eye. Um, But I'll just say that I was the sickest I've ever been in my life, absolutely. Um, And uh, it was certainly scary there for a little while. In the middle of my, uh, what I'm calling my (laughs) COVID and steroid-induced psychosis, anybody has ever had steroids? You ever had that for, yeah? Do you react badly? Yeah, yeah. Do you think you're going to die? Yeah. Just talk to Renee about uh, how ridiculous my mental state was. And then on top of that, I I got a yeast infection from the breathing treatments in my mouth, which is great. Don't you just love that? And then um, wasn't able to sleep because even the medication I was taking to help me sleep was having the reverse effect. And so there was four days there where maybe I slept about six hours. So there's parts of the sermon that may not make sense at all. And uh, I just beg your indulgence there. But one of the things that um, I did do, and this was my wife's idea, because again, I'm kind of out of my mind. She she got out my phone and she started playing the Word of Promise uh, scriptures. I I don't know if you guys have ever listened to that. It's audio and it's got sound effects and it's got all kinds of different voices of different actors that play the different different roles in scripture <clears throat> and specifically the psalms and you know the psalms are amazing and they're even more amazing when you're kind of out of your mind because these what 3500 year psalms you know, 3000 or so years ago these were written down many of them by a shepherd and a king And they are relevant today when we are going through the challenges that modern life gives us. Sickness, uh, anxiety, fear, um, financial situations, whatever it is. And these are just so powerful and relevant to us after all of this time. And it's kind of amazing to think that this could be the case. So some of these words are really encouraging to me. And and one particular passage, Psalm chapter 3, it's just eight verses. And this is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Right? So, I mean, he's in a really bad situation here. His son, whom he loved, has 
taken over his kingdom effectively and is, uh, he's at great um, risk of, of maybe losing his life to his own son. And so he wasn't really thinking about that part, but in the darkness, trying to sleep, trying to breathe and, and get through this sickness, these words were coming to me and um, like I say, it may not make uh, a lot of sense here, but it says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. And so again, in my COVID psychosis, I'm imagining all these little evil COVID viruses running through my body, you know, and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Many of these things, millions of these things. And I'm like, come on, immune system. Let's fight this. So that was in my mind. Many are they who say to me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. And, you know, it was, it was pretty scary for a little bit. And maybe, maybe made more so in my mind because of all my reactions to the, the medication. But this was so encouraging. It is him who lifts up our head when we're weak. It's him who lifts us, strengthens us. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. He did. He heard me. And he brought healing. Now, I know there are many that didn't receive healing. And that's a struggle to think about. But does it mean that he didn't hear them? In his timing, in his decision, in his way, he heard them nonetheless. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. You know, and that's, that's kind of something we're really sick, right? We're especially have a respiratory sickness and pneumonia, and we think, if I go to sleep, am I going to wake up again? You know, is my blood ox going to drop? And I was having difficulty kind of finding a, you know, a position to sleep in where I wouldn't get apnea because the lungs are so inflamed that those bronchial tubes will start to close off from your own body weight. And then you shock yourself awake, right, as you need to breathe and you're not getting that restorative sleep. And so this is a question that's running in your mind. Will I awake from this? But the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I'm not going to be afraid of these COVID viruses running through my body. God is greater. He is stronger. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You didn't know COVID had cheekbones, did you? <clears throat> you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. And so I really do, I feel that God helped me, helped all of us. You know, Renee was pretty sick too, and we're grateful she wasn't quite as bad as me because I don't know what we would have done. Um, she was able to, to help with my medication and, and my recovery. But God protected, God healed, and certainly, as I said before, many of you carried us in prayer. But I would not wish this disease on my worst enemy. And I know the statistics. I did a lot of research before I got COVID. And I certainly knew that <clears throat> there's some, many of the different factors that, that are going into this thing. But it really has struck me that it is an evil disease. It's an evil disease. And it might sound odd to say it's evil because you know, we normally use something, a term like that, because it's about, really about a person. You know, that viruses are not evil, right? I mean, they don't have a conscience. 
They don't have morality. They just do what viruses do. And yet, in many ways, this is an evil virus. Many of you may have done some research into this particular condition and how it affects the human body. It's a nasty pathogen. And it's particularly unique, I think, in its nastiness. The way that it can attack the body <clears throat> is multiple ways. And it is why I call it evil. It has an ability to interact with what are called ACE2 receptors. Have you guys heard about those? The ACE2 receptor. It's a very critical component uh, of our body's operation. It's a specialized enzyme. This ACE2 receptor is a specialized enzyme or protein that manages all kinds of systems in our body in all kinds of different areas. It's an amazing enzyme. You know, it's, it always strikes me as uh, amazing when I'm sitting in the doctor's office, I'm sick, you know, and I'm like, it's amazing that this part of my body works at all, you know, and, 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 and how our bodies function are just incredibly designed. And so when you get a sickness and you start to research it, you're like, this thing is amazing. How do I get it back to being as amazing as it was before? And so this ACE2 receptor, it helps to control cellular functions in the heart, the lungs, the body uh, in general, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the liver, and the gastrointestinal tract. It's all over the body. <coughs> and it has very specific vital roles in each of those areas. One of the areas is it's functioning within Epithelial, epithelial cells, if I say that right. And these cells are like the membranes that are protective in all the various different organs of the body, including the nose, the mouth, and the lungs. And of course, you know, that makes sense. COVID is a respiratory virus. These cells and the ACE2 enzymes perform a critical function to protect or allow for the proper operation of underlying systems. When it comes to the lungs, the ACE2 receptor and the epithelial cells operate in such a way as they protect the alveoli in the lungs and allow it to do its task, to do its job. Its job is to bring in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. So these ACE2 receptors are critical in the functioning of being able to receive in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. The SARS-CoV-2 virus attaches to the ACE2 receptor in such a way that it prevents it from doing its job. So just think about that. That this virus comes along has a spike protein, you know, we've all heard the spike protein term, it attaches into the ACE2 receptor and stops it doing its work. And so that's why many different conditions can arise from COVID, the, the most common obviously being lung related, but also heart related, liver, kidneys, everywhere where these ACE2 receptors are critical. They can affect blood pressure, they can affect uh, and cause, or uh, stroke because these functions are not being performed because the, the virus is essentially getting in the way. It's blocking the functioning in the body. Just think about this. As this virus does its work. It's replicating itself at a faster rate initially than the immune system can respond. And it's starting to weaken the body in the areas that we are already most weak. So in my situation, it attacked the lungs mostly. I have asthma. I'm more prone to those kinds of conditions. But somebody can have an underlying heart condition or some other organs. And that's where it's going to really manifest. It creates, because it blocks the work of this ACE2 receptor, 
it makes the body essentially, or allows the body to be over inflamed. They call it a cytokine storm, which is basically just a massive inflammatory response in the body, blocking all of the functioning that should be going on naturally. And this is why if it happens in the lungs, we have to give supplemental oxygen, right? And, and some people, unfortunately, have had to have that. <coughs> So the more I learned about this virus, and I'm just kind of skimming over it, I'm sure many of you know a lot more detail in here, the more it seems like an engineered assault on mankind. And I was just thinking about it, lying there, focusing on only one thing, which is breathing. And this virus is attacking my ability to breathe. You know, and the scriptures talk, you know, the, the scriptures that talk about that man's life is in his nostrils, right? And in his lungs, that's our breath, that's, that's, take that away and we're gone in, in seconds. And it was just, came across very strongly to me what an assault it was on mankind. It is an assault it can be on mankind and the impacts and the damage that are done along the way. So you may be asking, well, <clears throat> why, why are you talking about it today? Of course, the obvious is I just experienced it, right? We, we all process trauma by talking about it, by sharing our experience uh, with, with whatever has afflicted us. Like I said, laying there in the darkness, tired of Netflix, there's only so many TV shows you can stream, right? And you're just like, I don't even want to do that. And you lay there, listening to the Word of God, trying to continue to get better. Made me think about these things in a, a slightly different way. You know, even though the disease itself still, by the statistics, has a 98% or higher survival rate. It, I mean, it, a very high survival rate. It still impacts and causes damage along the way. Lots of different damage. Some long-term things, as simple as losing your taste and smell for a prolonged period, but in some instances, prolonged damage to vital organs. Yes, you survived, so you're in a survival statistic, but you did get some damage. So, what's the lesson in here for us today? Well, like I said before, for most of us, it's mostly a mild disease. <clears throat> it can be dangerous, though, for a few. I don't know if you've been keeping up with some of the more recent uh, information coming out, even in the mainstream media, which has been somewhat... Uh, what shall we say, curated and when it comes to information about the virus. But it's now really coming out, and the weight of evidence is coming out, that the virus was, in fact, as a result of man's manipulation of existing COVID viruses. Gain of function is becoming part of our vocabulary now, isn't it? We're all becoming gain of function professionals. And just thinking about it, even if COVID-19 was not produced by gain of function, they do perform gain of function work on SARS viruses. Are they insane? I mean, we have to ask that question, right? Because, I mean, the reasoning goes, well, if we can research and get out ahead of the virus, then if it naturally does it in the wild, then we'll be further prepared to combat it. And yet there's a significant amount of evidence that some of the worst versions of upper respiratory diseases have been from lab leaks from gain-of-function research. Uh, there's uh, various different ones. Um, swine, uh, is, no, one of the bird flu ones, 
Um, there's significant evidence that shows that that was the case, uh, and, and there's others. But we're being asked to believe that COVID-19 is different. That, that just happened in the wild. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. And it really, to me, underscores the hubris of mankind, right? To think that we can engineer and play around in really what is God's sandbox. And we don't think that there would be any consequences to our behavior. And that's at the best assessment. You know, I don't know if anybody thinks that working with China on making viruses more infectious and more deadly is a smart idea. How is that in any way logical for us to do? And so there's even a military application, of course, for messing around with biology and making things more dangerous potentially for use in, in warfare. In an article dated uh, September 9th, uh, 2021, so not too long ago, the uh, intercept.com, which is a news platform, uh, had this to say. <clears throat> it said, documents obtained by the intercept contain new evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the nearby Wuhan University Center for a Animal Experiment along with their collaborator, or collaborator, the U.S.-based nonprofit EcoHealth Alliance, have engaged in what the U.S. government defines as gain-of-function research of concern. So not just gain-of-function research, but of concern. Intentionally making viruses more pathogenic or transmissible in order to study them, despite stipulations from a U.S. funding agency that the money not be used for that purpose. And it was also specifically a violation of uh, Obama era order that required CDC and NIH not to fund gain of function research. They go on to say grant money from this controversial experiment came from the National Institutes of Health, uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases which is headed by none other than the high priest of the COVID response, Anthony Fauci. The award to EcoHealth Alliance, a research organization which studies the spread of viruses from animals to humans, included sub-awards to Wuhan Institute of Virology at East China Normal University. The principal investigator on the grant is EcoHealth Alliance President Peter Dezak, who has been a key voice in the search for the COVID-19 origins. Talk about Fox guarding the hen house. The guy that runs a company that researches how to gain function in viruses was for a while at the top of the investigation by the WHO on where did this COVID-19 virus come from? I wonder what his findings were gonna be. So much so, the actual the WHO has now initiated a new investigation because the first one just obviously isn't valid. And worse still, in the case of Dr. Fauci, he was able to get himself at the very top of the pandemic response. And yet we have now documented evidence, and some of which has been presented by Rand Paul in the US Senate showing that Fauci completely lied to Congress. And uh, there are even, in mainstream media now, some individuals questioning and suggesting that he needs to resign. There's an article in, on ABC News that was talking about that. This article goes on to say that there was no evidence directly linking the gain of function with, uh, in the Wuhan lab with COVID-19. But that's hardly surprising since the Chinese have destroyed all the evidence, cleared out the lab in question, and are not co 
cooperating with the WHO investigations. And then there's another article uh, in the Bloomberg, in Bloomberg News dated October 4th, 2021, entitled, China PCR purchases spiked in months before first known COVID cases. And they go on to say that the Chinese province uh, that was the initial epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak made significant purchases of equipment used to test for infectious diseases months before Beijing notified international authorities of the emergence of, new, of a new coronavirus, according to research by a, a cyber security company. The province's purchase of polymerase chain reaction or PCR testing equipment which allowed scientists to amplify DNA samples to test for the infectious disease or, or other genetic material shot upward in 2019, with most of the increases coming in the second half of the year, the Australian US firm Internet 2.0 found. The article also stated, <clears throat> quote, the origins of the coronavirus have become a hotly contested issue with the US and its allies accusing Beijing of resisting a more thorough investigation, including into allegations that the virus escaped from a Wuhan biosecurity lab where similar coronaviruses had been studied. In August, US intelligence officials released the summary of an investigation into the cause of the outbreak, but said they weren't able to reach firm conclusions because China refused to cooperate. Chinese officials denied that they were, they hindered the probe and evidently rebutted the Wuhan leak theory. But it's gaining in uh, credibility. You know, it's actually over the last 18 months gone from it absolutely was not at all a leak to it's probably a leak, uh, but we just don't know from, from where. Again, the hubris and the arrogance of mankind is really quite shocking, isn't it? We think that we know enough about viruses and bacteria and other different pathogens to manipulate them, to make them more transmissible, to make them more deadly, and think that we're not going to get any consequences from our behavior. Our arrogance as a species is literally breathtaking. I mean, it literally is breathtaking that we have done this. And now, according to a New Yorker magazine article uh, that was really, really in-depth, and a bunch of it over my head, for sure, scientists have been using antibodies from a recovered COVID-19 patient. And they've used those antibodies to run COVID-19 through what's called a, a process of serial passaging, where basically they keep reintroducing the virus to promote gain of function. And they were able to bring it to a point where the origini originating antibodies used from the survivor were no longer effective against a new version of the virus. They're doing it now. This is the hubris of mankind. I mean, it's unbelievable. When will they learn? Then in addition, of course, we now have our political leaders and have taken steps further in their hubris to mandate that other sovereign human beings must take medications or vaccines that they have developed because they can guarantee 100% that they're safe. The hubris of mankind. It's the height of arrogance, isn't it? But unfortunately, it's typical of mankind. In my COVID-induced delirium, there was another psalm that jumped out to me. It came uh, in, in sequence from, from the, uh, the, the first one I, I read earlier. 
And I think it really sheds light on this situation. Again, this is the power of Scripture and God's Word. It gives us an amazing context in which we can look at the things that we uh, have even in our modern world. In Psalm chapter 2, in verse, starting in verse 1, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. They're taking counsel together, these elites, these, these leaders. And we, you know, we can look at it in, in the area of science and health. We can look at it in the area of uh, general political leaders. They don't want to be constrained by God's rules anymore. They don't want his morality anymore. They don't want his control over their actions. They're saying, let's break this, these cords off of us. And this made me wonder, what would God think about all of this? What does he think about all of this? About how we're manipulating viruses and about how we're forcing vaccine mandates. What would his thoughts be in this situation? Would, would he be for that? Would he encourage us to have, uh, to force people uh, to take medication that they don't want in their body? Well, over in Micah chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 1, we really get a hopeful image of the future, God's kingdom, right? But it also tells us about how God, I think, considers each one of us how he views each one of us. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. You know, the opposite of what the nations do now, the opposite of what the leaders do now. For out of Zion shall go forth, uh, the, the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And then he says, but... This is in contrast, contrast to the world that we live in now, contrast to the way that man tries to rule over other men and the hubris of mankind to think that, that we can do this to one another without consequence. But the contrast is this, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. What this tells me is that God views us individually as sovereign human beings, responsible to him alone, not to any other man, not to any other authority, when it comes to how we should live our life. We will all have our own vine and our own fig tree. And if we choose to water that vine, that's our choice. If we choose to let it die, that's also our choice. We can decide for ourselves under God's direction in this new world that he is going to bring. We have freedom. We have autonomy. We can choose to take a medication or we can choose not to. Nobody will make us afraid. And you know, this world has been through absolute fear, hasn't it? Even if you're not afraid of the virus, you might be afraid of the consequences in society. You might be afraid of the actions of government. You might be afraid of the actions of corporations and how 
that may start to restrict our individual freedom. In this place, no one will make us afraid. I would like to be there. And I know you would too. And it's interesting, isn't it, that if mankind really wanted the best for his brother and his sister, if we really wanted the best, if our leaders really wanted the best for us, the world would look a lot more like this, wouldn't it? There would be humility in our leaders instead of hubris, instead of pride and arrogance, thinking that they can decide for each one of us how we should live our lives. We see, we would see mankind and the leaders of the nations accepting God's laws. But instead, we see them rejecting God's way, rejecting the nature of truth and biology. And I'm, I'm not convinced that there isn't a relationship between evolutionary biology, between a materialistic worldview, and how science conducts itself, and how medicine at these very specific dangerous moments is conducting itself. What's God's response to this hubris? What's God's response to our arrogance as a civilization? If we turn back to Psalm chapter 2, in verse 4, he says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Laughing at us. We don't even... We haven't even scratched the surface. And we think that we can create and destroy viruses at will and not have the consequences. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. So first he's going to laugh at us. Then he's going to deride us. And then he's going to bring his punishment on us and distress them in his deep displeasure. He's going to mock us, and then he's going to bring his judgment. And then he does it in a very specific way. And, and this passage here, I love this passage because it is the gospel in the Psalms. It's the good news of the soon coming kingdom of God and of its king, Jesus Christ, in the Psalms, he says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. He's going to take all these vaunted leaders... All these men and women that think they know how all of science works, how biology works, who think that they can decide what another human being should do with their own body. And they will be completely crushed and broken. Dashed into pieces. And it cannot come soon enough. How long, O oh Lord, isn't it what we read, faithful and true, will you not avenge those who think that they have the right to control mankind? But even in his judgment, even in his wrath, God is merciful. And he gives these leaders an opportunity. And they have this opportunity now. If they would just read these words, if they would listen to what God says. He says, now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be wise. Don't be so stupid. Don't be so full of hubris and pride that you think you have all the answers. Be instructed. Have a heart that is open to God's instruction. Humble to his tutorage. You judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, 
lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Kiss the son. Who is that? Son of God. Jesus Christ the King. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. All these leaders, these self-appointed kings of science, these presidents, these rulers, are being watched. We're watching them. We're witnesses. But more than that, God is watching them. And if they're wise, if they're humble, they will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. And they will kiss his ring. And if not, he will bring the rod of iron. We see that in many, many places in Scripture. They are on notice. <clears throat> But we, here's the promise for us, we will be blessed. We will be blessed if we put our trust in him. Even in the midst of these situations and the trials that we find ourselves in life. Hope this is making sense. As I say, some of this is derived from my COVID delirium, so have grace on me. But it's interesting, though. It's entirely likely that this message might get banned from YouTube. Because, you know, they have algorithms that are in place on the videos that are uploaded to YouTube. Um, one of them is kind of pretty cool. You can turn on uh, closed captioning. So you can, you know, read what somebody's saying. And, and that's all done, uh, you know, through their system and with... with uh, computers and um, listening to our voice and adding the text. <clears throat> but then it also gives them the ability to filter, filter out anything that may be opposing uh, their worldview. Might be considered anti-science. You know those Christians are pretty much anti-science, right? You know. Really? Is God anti-science? Is he against medicine? Is he actually against using things that are in our environment to help our health? It's not what we get from Isaiah, is it? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And, you know, we certainly find ourselves <coughs> very much in this kind of situation here. The Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider. Alas, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, and children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why would you be stricken again? You revolt more and more, and the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. And I know what that feels like. And many of you, too, also know what that feels like. When we're sick, the whole head is sick, the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed up or bound up, or soothed with ointment. God's not anti-science. He's not about not applying the things that he's created to health, to growth, to restoration of our strength and our ability. They're hard words to listen to. But in the midst of this, God is saying, you, you need healing. Why would you be wounded anymore? Why would you have more sickness? Is our science working for us? Are our medicines working for us? God is saying, you need to bind up these wounds. 
anoint them, and heal them. I mentioned before about, I'm, I'm curious about the link, and I, I maybe need to research that. Maybe you guys have, but it seems to me that in a lot of the decisions being made regarding the, the pandemic, it, it does seem that having a materialistic worldview, an evolutionary worldview, is affecting the morality of the choices that are being made by our scientists. I'm not too sure that it would be forcing medical approaches on people if they had a godly moral understanding of science. And it's almost as though our humanity is discarded in the process. Our individual sovereignty is discarded in the process. <clears throat> so I, it's a question. Are we suffering in many ways because of this worldview? But then there's also something ironic going on here. Because the materialistic worldview, the evolutionary worldview, says that, you know, essentially that species have developed through evolutionary processes over time and, and that evolutionary processes continue. And yet, in order to understand what the evolutionary path may be for a pathogen, the scientific community are applying intelligent design. Did you realize that? Or maybe it's more like unintelligent design. Because in their work of gain of function, they are artificially evolving pathogens, supposedly to be ready for when it naturally does it all by itself. But that of itself is a kind of an odd rejection of the notion that the materialistic world didn't have a designer. So that by messing around with viruses, by applying their own intelligence to the design, I think they're undermining their claim of natural selection. <coughs> Excuse me. But again, God is not anti-science. He has made this world. He has made the, the, the biological systems that are, that are in this world. And he's created compounds that can help us in our health. But what is really clear to me, I think, through this whole experience, what we've all experienced, is that apart from God, man will do nothing but twist and corrupt what he has made and create very dangerous situations along with it. But we have a promise because we have man's hubris on one side, but on the other, we have the hope of God's promise that we will have a better world in which to listen and learn and grow and develop. In Isaiah chapter 2, <coughs> Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 1, he's, he's mirroring uh, Micah. It's almost verbatim. And it says, the word of the Lord, that, uh, the, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He said, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Just think about that. There's going to come a day when the supreme power on the earth will not be the United States. It won't be the European Union. It won't be China. It won't be Russia. It won't be these transnational organizations like the, the WHO or the UN. There will be no power that could stand up to the power of the kingdom of God. It will be the center of what? We think about world powers. What are they of the center of? 
They are the center of commerce. They are the center of science. They are the center of technology, of culture, of literature, of religious influence, or not. This is what it means for the kingdom of God, for the mountain of God to be established on top of, above all other nations, all other powers. It will govern and control all human life on earth. And if you think that's not possible, just think about this from history. During the, uh, I think it's considered to be the 1800s, the British Empire controlled directly 70% of the world's trade and indirectly the other 30%. And that's just a kingdom of man, of man's creation. The kingdom of God will be absolute. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, as we read before in Micah, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. You know, in some ways we might look at this and say that, or think that when the people go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the, to the God of Israel, to learn of his ways and his law, we might be thinking it's in a strictly religious, moral process. But that would actually not be the case. The word law here also means direction, instruction teaching. The word path and ways means exactly that. Ways of living, ways of learning, ways of understanding. So think about this. The kingdom of God, the mountain of God is supreme over all nations and all nations will flow to it so that they can learn about what? About science about bi virology, about biology, and learn how to do it safely, a way that's protected. They'll be able to learn astronomy and physics. Just think about that, being taught by God about the things that he's created. All the nations will flow to him. They'll learn technology and law philosophy and history, in geology, the study of cultures, economics, but all in God's way, all in his way, and in truth. But it requires something, doesn't it? It requires something that we talked about earlier. We need be humble. As individuals, as a race, as mankind, we need to drop the hubris and pick up humility, to be teachable, to be willing to listen to the words of the Lord. Many shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. Or as Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, Likewise, you young people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. And then he says something really vital for us individually, but then for mankind to understand God resists the proud. He will actively resist us when we are proud. He will resist those rulers who act in their hubris. He will resist us when we're prideful. But he gives grace 
to the humble. He gives us his grace when we humble ourselves. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. What would it look like if this week there was a press conference at the White House and the President of the United States humbled himself before God and said, you know what? Our approach to this has not been right. We're going to reboot this for everyone's benefit. And we're going to seek God's guidance. Because I, I think it's possible now, isn't it? Each one of us can now access through the veil. We can all access God through Jesus Christ. Could our leaders not do the same? Of course they could. They need to drop the hubris and pick up the humility. I wish they would. I wish we all would be more humble and follow God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 to close, I think this also speaks to the humility that we need to have as individual Christians, but also as mankind. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. If we are humble, if we reject the hubris of mankind, if we reject our pride, that we can decide what's best for the world. And if we have faith in Christ Jesus, then the world itself can be redeemed. Even a world full of pathogens and diseases and corruption and death can be redeemed by the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. But not only that, we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is, not, that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait, wait for it with perseverance. Let's persevere. Let's seek God's face. Let's humble ourselves. And he'll give us grace. He'll lift us up. And hope in this scripture that the whole creation will be redeemed as we are redeemed. Thank you again for your prayers. God bless. Have a good Sabbath.